Chapter 13. After cutting the dragon free, Minli's knife was dull and the skin on her fingers and toes was wrinkled from having been in the dragon's lake of tears for so long. She was also very thirsty. The dragon offered to carry her to the freshwater stream. He knew the forest well. You'll get there much faster, he said. Minli was a little doubtful about riding the dragon. It was one thing to climb on top of him while he was half covered by water, but now on dry land, she realized how large he really was. The dragon was long, as long as the street in front of Minley's house. If he stretched himself up on his arms and legs, he was as tall as a bird's nest in a tree, she realized. Even now, bending down for her, he was higher than her house. But he bent his elbow for her like a step and with two hands she boosted herself up and then climbed onto his back. The round ball on the dragon's head was the size of a small melon, just big enough for her to wrap two hands around, and she clutched it as the dragon began to move. It was faster, but not much. The dragon was nimble, but his large body had to constantly maneuver around trees and rocks, so it was awkward going. The constant jerking made Minley feel like she was riding a huge water buffalo. As the dragon ducked underneath branches and swerved through trees, Minley understood why most dragons flew. Dragon, Minley asked suddenly, how old are you? Old, the dragon said, and again it seemed a question he had never been asked. I do not know. Well, Minley said, how long have you been in this forest? The dragon thought hard. A long time, he told her. I remember when a bird flew from the sky and dropped a peach pit onto the ground. I watched that pit grow into a tree and the peaches fell from the tree and more trees grew from those pits at those peaches until it became the grove of peach trees that the monkeys have now taken over. He is very old, Minley thought to herself, imagining the growth of the trees. Dragon must have been in this forest for a hundred years. And she felt a pang of pity as she imagined the dragon alone, unable to fly, endlessly struggling between trees and branches. After picking up her things and drinking at the freshwater stream, Minley climbed back onto the dragon's back. She soon fell asleep, her head on the dragon's ball and her hand holding her rice bowl. Noticing she was asleep, the dragon moved slowly and quietly, even when the water from Minley's compass splashed and trickled down his nose. It was only when a sound shrieking It was only when a loud shrieking filled the forest that Minley woke. It was such a wild and harsh noise that she bolted up, her eyes wide open in fear. Do not worry, the dragon told her. It's just the monkeys. It was the monkeys, even though the sun was dimming. Minley could still see the monkeys clamoring in the trees. Even though Minley could not count that many of them, their screaming made it sound as if there were thousands. We are getting close to the peach trees, the dragon told Minley, and they are getting angry. Stop here, Minley said. She climbed off the dragon's back and she could still see the monkeys through leaves and branches, their bared teeth flashing. Those peach trees are exactly the direction we want to go, Minley said. We have to get past the monkeys. I could still force my way through, but the monkeys would attack you, Dragon said. I am not sure if we could get, through, get you through unharmed. Listen to them. And the monkeys continued to scream. Minley covered her ears with her hands, but she could still hear them. It seemed like they were screeching, get away from here, ours, ours, all ours. You're right, Minley told the dragon. They are not going to let us through. But you said that is the way to the old man of the moon, said the dragon, correct? Minley nodded. The monkey's shrieks were starting to sound like hysterical laughter, getting louder and louder like a volcano about to erupt. She looked from side to side, but the monkeys seemed to be everywhere. There was no way around them. Then the dragon asked, what are we going to do? Chapter 14. 
Chapter 14 Minley and the dragon had sat in the clearing and made camp for the night. As the sun fell and the moon rose, the dragon showed her how he could make sparks by scratching his claws against a stone, and they built a small campfire. As Minley and the dragon made no moves to go farther into the forest, the monkeys had quieted down, but they still watched. There are plenty of peaches for all, dragon said. Those monkeys do not have to be so greedy. Really? Minley asked. Yes, dragon said. The monkeys are so foolish. They just want more and more, even when they do not need it. I have seen them refuse to let go of rotten mushrooms and fight over piles of mud. At those words, Minley sat up and her eyes flashed with quick thinking. Piles of mud? Suddenly, Minley remembered the two children fighting over their piles of mud as she had left her village. Instead of going inside for dinner, the children had clung to their pretend dishes of dirt. They were so foolish. Could the monkeys be that foolish? They were too selfish for trading or bribes, but maybe they were so greedy that they could be foolish enough to be tricked? Maybe if she... I'm going to make rice, Minley said abruptly. Oh, said the dragon, you must be hungry. Too bad we cannot get you some peaches. It's not for me, Minley said, and she smiled mysteriously. It's for the monkeys. The monkeys, the dragon said. Why? If you mean it as a gift or as a way to bribe them, it will not work. They will take it and eat it, but they still will not let you through. That is what I am expecting, Minley said as she filled her pot with water and uncooked rice. She was bursting to tell dragon her idea, but wasn't sure how much the monkey understood of her words. She looked at him with sparkling eyes, but, she, but he only stared back blankly. You are, the dragon said. I do not understand. Don't worry, Minley said, and with her eagerness, she felt like the water she was boiling. I think I know how we can pass the monkeys. The dragon watched as Minley stirred the big pot of rice. Through the rising steam, he could see the beady eyes of all the monkeys glittering through the branches like thousands of diamonds as they watched as well. The monkeys are watching, he whispered to Minley. Good, she whispered back. I hope they are. When the rice was done, the pot was overflowing with snowy white rice. It was so heavy that it, to take it off the fire to cool, she had to ask the dragon to move it for her. Minley had the dragon place it very close to the trees where the monkeys were watching. Then Minley tied her fishnet over the rice and pot. As Minley and the dragon turned away, they could hear the monkeys chattering. That fishnet will not stop the monkeys from taking the rice, the dragon said. It is tightly woven, but their hands will probably fit through. I know, Minley said as she put out the fire. Let's pretend we think the rice is safe and we are letting it cool. Though puzzled, the dragon nodded. They placed themselves a far distance from the rice, yet still within sight, put out the fire and pretended to go to sleep. But Minley could not help peeking. Though she tried to lie still, she was filled with excitement. Would her plan work? Would the monkeys take the rice? In the bright light of the moon, the monkeys glanced slyly at them and stole over to the rice. The dragon was right. Just as he'd said, the fishnet could not keep the monkeys from the rice. Their slender hands slid through the holes of the fishnet and each grabbed two big fistfuls of rice. But as the monkeys tried to carry the rice away, the net caught them. The holes in the net were large enough for their empty hands to fit through, but not large enough for their full fists. The monkeys screamed and pulled, and Minley and the dragon no longer pretended to be asleep. They couldn't help laughing as they watched the monkeys struggling to punch the air and each other with their trapped fists. Minley quickly packed her things, and the monkeys screeched and shrieked as they passed. 
The heavy pot of rice shook as the monkeys fought violently to get free, but the fish net was strong and well woven, and since the monkeys were too greedy to let go of the rice, Minley and the dragon entered the peach grove and continued through the forest. Chapter 15 Ma and Ba sat in front of a small fire that Ba had built. Their disappointment at not having found Minley forced them to admit their exhaustion, and they had slept under the canopy of tree branches during the day, leaving their silver goldfish as a guardian. By the time they'd awakened, it was late afternoon, but neither of them made any attempt to move. Neither spoke, but both knew they were unsure whether to go forward or go back. While the hot sun burst into multicolored flames on the horizon, its last wave goodbye before surrendering to the night, Ma handed Ba a bowl of rice porridge. Neither of them spoke as they ate, both thinking about the goldfish man's words. Should they let Minley try to change their fortune? Should they stop looking and, like the goldfish man said, trust her? Ba sighed. Trying to find Minley is like trying to find the paper of happiness, Ba said aloud to himself. What paper of happiness, a voice said. Ba looked sharply around. Who had said that? He looked at Ma, but she continued to stir her porridge, obviously unaware. Ba shook his head. Perhaps his weariness was making him imagine things. Tell the story, old man. She's listening. The voice spoke again. She won't admit it, but she wants to hear it too. Ba looked around again. It seemed like the voice was coming from the goldfish. He looked closely at the bowl. Was it the firelight that made it glow like that? The fish stared back at him calmly, as if waiting. So Ba took a deep breath and began the story. The Story of the Paper of Happiness Once, a long, long time ago, a family grew famous for their happiness. It seemed odd that this would happen, but they were truly an unusual household. Even though aunts and uncles, cousins and grandchildren lived together, there was never a cross word or an unhappy noise. All were polite and thoughtful to each other, even the chickens did not fight each other for feed. It was said even the babies were born smiling. Stories of their happiness spread like seeds in the wind, sprouting and blooming everywhere, until finally even young Magistrate Tiger heard of them. Even though he had just begun his position, this was before his son was born. The bellowing, roaring magistrate was already called Magistrate Tiger. Impossible, he scoffed. The stories are exaggerated. No family can be that happy. But even so, he was curious and sent an emissary to the family to observe. The emissary returned awed. Your magnificence, it is just as the stories say, he said. I observed the family for a full moon and not one sad or angry word was even whispered. The adults are loving and faithful. The children are gracious and respectful and all honor the grandfather with an esteem that rivals the gods. Even the dogs do not bark, but wait patiently to be fed. The family circle is one of complete harmony. That's impossible, the magistrate said, astonished. But as he thought about it, the more he began to wonder, what was the secret that the family had? They must have some magical charm or hidden knowledge. And this began to irritate him. He began to covet the family's happiness. I am the magistrate, he thought. If there is a secret to happiness, I should have it. So he called his emissary to him and presented him with an empty, heavily encrusted chest with a company of soldiers. Return to the family, Magistrate Tiger ordered, and tell them that I want the secret of their happiness put in this box. If they do not do so, 
have the soldiers destroy their home. The emissary did as he was told. When the troop of soldiers surrounded the house, the family looked fearful. But when the magistrate's demand was announced, the grandfather smiled. That is easy enough, he said, and he had the trunk brought into the house and returned in moments. It is done. I've put the secret of our happiness inside the box, he said, and you may take it. We hope it serves our magistrate well. The emissary was slightly surprised at the ease of his task, but could find no objection. So he turned the soldiers and the box around and began to travel back to the palace. The emissary knew the magistrate would be impatient for his return, so the soldiers marched through the night with only the light of the moon to guide them. The treasure box lying on a platform carried by four men seemed to glow. However, as the ground grew rocky and steep, a sudden wind blew like the mountain itself was yawning. One of the soldiers stumbled in the rising dust and the box crashed to the ground. The lid of the box flew off and, like a freed butterfly, a single sheet of paper fluttered out. Get it, the emissary shouted at the soldiers. Don't lose the secret. But despite his yells, the paper seemed to be able to escape the soldiers' flailing arms. One soldier almost caught it, his very fingertips touching the page, but another sudden wind burst through the air and stole it away. Silently, the emissary and the soldiers watched the paper lift higher and higher in the night sky until it overlapped the moon and disappeared. The emissary had no choice but to return to the palace with an empty box. As he relayed the story, Magistrate Tiger, not surprisingly, was enraged. You lost it? It was a paper? The magistrate roared. What was on it? Your magnificence, the emissary trembled. As I felt the secret was for your eyes only, I did not read the paper before it was lost. However, it, as it was in the air, all could see that there was a single line of words on it. What did the line say? The magistrate demanded. I don't know, magistrate, the emissary said. But there is one soldier who almost caught it and was closest to it. Perhaps he was able to read the line. So the soldier was called in and very humbly did he bow. He was little more than a boy and had only recently joined the magistrate's army from a small, poor, faraway village. You, the magistrate said, you were the only soldier close enough to read the paper and read the line. What did it say? The boy flushed and his head touched the floor as he bowed again. Great magistrate, I am your poor servant, he said. I was close enough to see the line on the page. However, I cannot read. I do not know what the line said. Magistrate Tiger scowled with irritation and the emissary and the sh soldier shivered. I... I did notice something, the soldier said. What? The magistrate demanded. There was only one character on the page, the soldier said. The line was one word written over and over again many times. One word? The magistrate snarled and his anger seemed to burn deep in his eyes. One word is the secret to happiness? It was a trick. The family must have thought they could deceive me. Emissary, gather all of my troops. I personally will get the secret of happiness and punish that family of lowly dogs. So the next day, the magistrate tiger and his entire army prepared for destruction. The emissary led the way to the home of the happy family. But when they arrived, nothing was there. No house. No chickens or sheep, no family. Instead, there was only a flat plain as if the whole home had been scooped up from the earth. Magistrate Tiger scowled at the blank ground with rage and vowed to punish the family for the, their disrespect. But while he glared, 
the wind blew and covered him with a grayish green dust. As he stood like a green powdered statue, he felt as if the sky were laughing at him. So, I think Minley, like the secret word on the paper of happiness, Ba said, is not meant to be found. He glanced at Ma while she did not meet his gaze. She made no objection either. And tomorrow, Ba continued gently, we should return and wait for her to come home. Again, Ma said nothing, but barely, perhaps only because he was looking for it, she nodded. Ba nodded back at her and quietly took some rice and dropped it into the fishbowl.